So uh, I'm just going to present a little bit about uh, a project me and a colleague did while working at, at Fox IT this year, um, which was all about trying to apply some tempest attacks against AES. Um, and just before I, I talk about the high levels of the, the project and who was involved, I've got three slides that should try and get everyone up to speed with, uh, well, what that title meant, basically. So uh, for this code, maybe this is a bit, bit basic, but um, it doesn't matter what your product is, if it's an ASIC or an FPGA or some JavaScript program you've made, at some level, it's, it's really just pushing electrons about, and that's, that's all it's doing. And as my, uh, my Scottish friend, James Clerk Maxwell says, well, said, um, if you're pushing electrons about, you're going to make a magnetic field kind of around the direction of the current. And there's, there's nothing stopping us just taking some antenna and trying to measure that magnetic field from a considerable distance. And uh, if we can actually do some analysis to retrieve something useful from that signal we measure, we have a tempest attack. So the tempest here kind of implies we're doing it from a, a considerable distance. Uh, if you're wanting to, to look up other literature about this, you have to be a wee bit careful because that's actually a, an American code name. So I think in, in Europe, maybe EMSEC is more, more widely used, uh, or EM analysis equally, or EMA. So if I thought of this earlier, I would have called this EMA from far away, but too late now. Okay. Okay. Still though, it's all capitals and it's really ugly. <laughs> um, but the, uh, right, so the, the people involved in the project, there was one guy who kind of started this off at, at Fox IT as an intern. And then the work I'm presenting today was from myself and Jasper Lohaus, who uh, we worked together on, the, on this project. Um, we both kind of moved on a little bit from this now, but we've left Frank, uh, Frank van Tienen in charge and he should have something interesting to show in some months, hopefully. Um, so just before going into the technical stuff, as I said, this was done while we were both at, at Fox IT and they, uh, they gave us food, gave us shelter. It was lovely, threw lots of nice toys at us. And the same goes for, for Riskier. They were very generous with their, their time and their guidance on this. Uh, so we weren't working entirely in a vacuum here. There's, there's existing work uh, kind of surrounding this. So from our perspective, there's, there's these tempest attacks, which are, are trying to make measurements from a, a considerable distance. And then there's, there's what we're calling uh, on-package attacks, which is where an attacker has full physical access, so can have this device, can crack open the case, and they're really measuring across the surface of the, the chip's package. So we've seen papers that kind of uh, apply both of those attacks to, to asymmetric crypto. Uh, there's some really nice ones in overlap here that exploit some, some parts of the algorithm where you end up being able to amplify the effects of, of certain bits. Um, but that sort of pattern doesn't really apply for any symmetric crypto. So there are many on-package attacks we've seen, but there's a little bit of a gap in the market right here. And that's kind of what we're trying to fill in with, with our work here. So we're wanting to see if, if attacking AES would be actually possible at all from, from a considerable distance. If it is, what sort of resources do we need? And something for the future would be going as far as trying to say, well, there are these norms you have to conform to if you want to kind of try and prove your device is uh, defended against this, where if any of these signals are over a certain power, then the, the norm kind of assumes that 
it could be broken. But what sort of resources would you need to try and actually attack a device that today we think is, is secure? So that's, that's something for the, the future. Um, the first stage of this, before we try and do anything from, from a distance, is just in-house trying to set up some, uh, some attack where if we have full access and we're right on top of the chip, if we can actually get an AES key out. So with a, a very hand-wavy overview, uh, we've got some device we want to attack, um, and then a kind of pipeline of processing for our actual analysis. So our, our target device was as simple as we could make it. It's just a, a dev board with an ARM CPU on it. It started off with a, a Cortex M3 and then ended up with an A9. Um, but on that, we're just running an open SSL style AES. So it's, it's a sensible implementation, but not hardened. Uh, so we just got that straight from GitHub. Um, and we just set it up so we can send it a message. It'll encrypt it on the chip, and then it'll say, here you go, with the result. So we can kind of on demand do encryption with it, which makes things a little a little easier. So now looking over at our first stage of our, our pipeline here, um, we need something to actually react to the field that is around this device. So we've got some sort of antenna. We get this horrible looking signal, push it through some filtering to clean it up a little bit, and then finally amplification. So next we have to have to take the analog signal and do some magic and digitize it so we can actually store it and run our analysis later. But th this is actually the the biggest difference in our setup before we get the distance from a lot of the other papers you see. Um, most of the time, there's just an oscilloscope that sits here, which is really just this ADC. Uh, but we've improved it quite a lot just by using radio hardware, because if you're using an oscilloscope for this, if your, your clock frequency is quite high, you end up just generating a lot of data because you're you're recording all of the signals of all frequencies from zero all the way up to your, your clock and beyond. But with, with the uh, radio hardware, we're basically taking a very small band of those frequencies that we're actually interested in. And in hardware, we're just throwing away all the other information. So it's fast enough that uh, it's a uh, low enough uh, data rate that we can just stream it constantly. And that really speeds up uh, our attack. Uh, so for a bit of pre-processing, we've got um, this continuous recording we make, and then we have to go through it with some software. We had some MATLAB scripts that try and identify exactly where the different blocks of encryption are happening. Um, so we have to go through this continuous recording and then slice up into individual blocks of AES. So later we can uh, go in and compare them. So once we've got those those separate uh, aligned blocks of AES, we can then put them through some software from Riskier, the in, uh, inspector tool. And as long as we tell it how to properly model our device, uh, we should just get a key that falls out the other end and then job done. But so that, that was the hand-waving overview. Uh, this is more about how it looks in practice. Um, so our, our antenna to start with is this EM probe. And really, all this is, is if you look at the tip, just in here, there's a tiny loop of wire. It's about a millimeter in, in diameter. And that, that's what's really reacting to the, the field. Um, we've got a bit of shielding around it. And then it's just amplifiers in here. Um, for our radio recording, we had a couple of different devices, actually. Um, this is the one we ended up using for our final distance attacks. So it's the only one I'm, I'm covering here. Uh, but the interesting thing about this RTL SDR dongle is 20 euros. Uh, 
has got quite small bandwidth, but it turns out that's that's all we need. So comparing this to the oscilloscopes you'd, you'd typically find, uh, so even the, the cheaper Pico scopes, they're for at least a thousand or so euros. So this, this is already something kind of interesting in our, our setup that we managed to prove works. Um, okay, and here's one of the other radios we ended up not using for the the final attack, mainly because it's it's so heavy. Um, but we just position the probe right on top of our, our target device here. And just with your hand, you can really scan across the surface of the chip and try and find out where this, this arm core actually is. So you see a nice big spike over the, the clock frequency. Um, and that really is just, just by hand. It takes a couple of minutes. Um, so if, if you take a recording from this, you get something that looks a bit like this, um, where there's there's some clear patterns here, but it's uh, it's actually very easy to tie up to what the algorithm is doing. So at, at the start and end, we have some idle points uh, just not before we're doing anything. We have a little burst of I/O where our plain text and key are transferred to the the ARM processor. And then at the end, the ciphertext comes out. Um, in here, you might be able to see there's 14 unique spikes. Uh, that comes from generating these 14 round keys from the main. Uh, this is AES-256, so there, there's 14 rounds. So each of these spikes is where it generates uh, a round key. And then we've got the 14 rounds of actual encryption here. So you can see one wider one, one shorter one, one wider one, one shorter one. That's uh, It comes from uh, the way the loop is kind of unrolled once, so it's really two lots of seven. But that matches exactly with what we expected from the, the 14 rounds of encryption. So you have that pattern and you can kind of, if you link it up with code, you can kind of understand what's what's going on, but that still seems quite a far way from actually having having the key that's hidden on the device. Um, I should note that this this part really is existing side channel analysis. It's all, uh, it's all the same analysis really, uh, but it's worth trying to, to walk through that in a, an understandable way. So that, that trace I showed you is kind of related to the, the power consumption of a certain part of the chip. Um, if you start to think about what constitutes the power consumption, you've got some static component just keeping things alive. You've got noise from everywhere, and it's a real pain. Um, but we're trying to say that there's some dependence on the data that is being handled as well. Uh, and also something that depends on what operation you're doing on that data. So the interesting part here, as we've said, there's some dependence on the data. So is there a way we can take lots of those traces and try and work out what data is being handled in the algorithm? Uh, to do that, we have to start looking at just correlations. So to, to explain what we're doing here, uh, I've got three completely fake traces. Uh, we're saying to this AES encryption, we passed this byte, and this is the recording we made. Equally, we did it a second time with a different input and got this suspiciously similar looking trace. Um, so to try and see if we can detect any data, what we do is we have to take this byte and try and model how much how much power that's used. So the the simplest way you can you can do that is say, right, well I have a, this bus. It only takes me energy to make a bit one. If it's a zero, I'm not doing anything. Um, so what we can do is to start with just count the ones in each of the bytes. So 
top one. We say that took us four uh, units of, of power energy. Second one, there's only one one, so one here, and then six ones in the bottom. So to do our, our correlation, what is actually being evaluated is we're taking the first sample of every single trace, and we're saying, is this sample here about four times as big as this one? And likewise, is this sample here about a sixth of this one? So does the uh, the thing we measured actually depend on this input data at all? And what we do is we just step through every single sample in the traces. So if there is a dependence, we get a nice big spike. If not, it's kind of a, a flat flat line. So if we if we apply that to some actual real data, um, so real input data, not our, our fake ones here. We get a trace a bit like this, where here's our correlation for each each bit in the input and output data. Um, and this is, this is just for reference for timing, so we can see where things happen in the algorithm. But you'll see there's, there's a set of spikes uh, just as we're starting the encryption here, which is where all our input data is being handled and uh, is about to enter the first round. And similarly, we have a, a bunch at the end, just as the output is being calculated. So the fact that there's correlation in, in those two places and not anywhere in the middle kind of suggests that we can see that that data has been handled by the device purely by measuring the field. So the only trick to then get a key from that is you don't look at the input data, because that's kind of boring. We already, already know what that data is. You step very slightly into the algorithm. Um, so just after the point where the, the key is, is used. So if you can find some point in the algorithm that is only affected by a single byte of the key, you can then start to do this correlation to brute force a single byte at a time. Um, and that makes your, your search space, instead of 2 to the power of 256, you're now brute forcing the bytes individually. And I know powers of 2 are hard, so 8,000 guesses are needed for this compared to just a, a stupid number. Um, and there, there's a bit of an art in picking the right uh, intermediate value you're trying to attack. Uh, so I'm going to kind of gloss over that, but I do have backup slides if any of you are interested afterwards. Um, so we chose one intermediate value. Um, our implementation was using these T tables, which is a, a very, very common implementation for 32-bit uh, processors. It just reduces the whole encryption down to these table lookups, these t table lookups, and then XORing the key, and you just repeat that. Um, so now instead of looking at input data, we're looking at uh, the data coming out of our table lookups. Um, so for this this example, uh, we already know the key, so we're we're trying to show this data is actually in the trace. You can see there's a very nice. Uh, very narrow peak here, which I've then zoomed in on over here. Um, so you can see there, there's definitely correlation with with that stage, which depends on the key. Um, and this is actually what we use in our attack later on. This is this is kind of the the hollow world modeling of of this sort of attack. Um, but we notice some of them are correlating up, some of them are correlating down, and are scratching our heads a little bit about that, trying to find out exactly what was actually going on there, because uh, we would have expected it all to be nicely in the, the same polarity. So just to satisfy, satisfy our own interest, really, uh, we went a bit further. I pestered riskier. They were nice enough, uh, there's some guys there, to point me in the right direction with this, where it's not necessarily just the data you're looking at, it's also uh, address lines can, can often leak. So 
I went away, tried that. Um, so to get these addresses, we had to look at the assembly a little bit. Um, this is the reason we're not using our, our improved model in our attack, because from a distance, it's unlikely you're going to have this disassembly, to be honest. So we have one load word here that is actually doing this table lookup. So we are interested in this address here. Um, but it turned out we were also looking at the switching power of our bus, not just the uh, the single value here. It was a switching between this value and the next one. Uh, so if you take this address and work out how many bits change when we're loading the next instruction down here, uh, we can rerun the correlation. And we get, as we expected, all of the same bits, uh, all of the bits in the same polarity. And we're, we're fairly happy that what we're actually measuring is the the switching of address lines. Um, but because you need all the, the disassembly, we use the more, more simple model in our actual attacks. So in a case where we don't know the key, for, for our attack to work, we have to actually guess all 256 options for each byte and rerun the correlation. And if the, uh, the correlation spike for the correct key is largest, that means we can recover what the key is without knowing it in the first place. So for an example, uh, I've plotted a correlation spike for our real key byte. And I'm about to overlay all of the other wrong guesses. And you can see that they all fall kind of just under the correct spike. So only through this correlation, we can work out what a byte of the key is. And then all we do is repeat that for all the bytes in the key, and job done. Uh, so to kind of try and summarize our results before we start doing this from a distance, um, we actually found it was fairly easy to do unless there are countermeasures in your way. Um, and what we've plotted here is uh, the bandwidth of our recording. So this dictates the, the file size effectively and how many different blocks of encryption we had to observe before we were confident we had the right key. Um, so every point in this line is, is a success. It's just you need to observe more and more different traces before you're you're confident. So the interesting thing for us was this uh, this spikes up very, very sharply right at the end. Um, so if we mark on the bandwidth of our 20 euro radio, it's still totally fine. We can use that radio without really degrading our attack too much, even though it is so cheap. And uh, Actually, we might as well change these these axes uh, because the bandwidth really just dictates how cheap your your recording setup can be, and the traces just dictates how long you have to be near the device. So, essentially, you've got your equipment getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as you come down here, but it's still possible with with even cheaper things. It's just you have to to spend a lot more time observing the device. Um, OK, so uh, moving on to actually trying to perform this as a Tempest attack, we're moving further and further away from the uh, the actual target device. Um, and in doing that, we are only changing the analog side, so our, uh, our filtering amplification and antenna. All of the analysis that I just walked through is completely the same. That's that's nothing new. So if we look back at the antenna we were using before, um, I said this this was really just a coil of wire. It was about a millimeter diameter. So 
the effective area this measures is kind of in the same order of magnitude. Um, but remember, this this literally is a coil of wire, and there's some amplifiers in here, albeit a very, very well engineered one. Um, this is also a loop of wire, albeit a very, very poorly engineered one. Um, Jasper, the guy I was working with, just got a bit of cable, some scissors, cut the end off. Um, you loop the, the signal back round to touch the shielding, and that's really it. Um, obviously, we, we also need some some off-the-shelf amplification. Uh, so we, we've got a, an amplifier for mini circuits here, and then two, two bandpass filters um, just to try and clean up the signal a little bit. Um, but these these are really not expensive. I think this was about 80 euros or so for the amplifier. Um, so again, with that really, really dumb loop of wire, the attack totally still worked. The only problem is, um, as you move the antenna away from the chip, the signal you're interested in decays very quickly. So we've tried to plot that here with the power of the signal along this axis, and then the distance from our target along here. So it kind of drops off in this reciprocal fashion here, um, which really isn't what we want. Um, right, so we had actually quite a nice demo when we were both uh, working on this project, um, where we'd get someone to to guess a key, uh, not guess a key, uh, make up a key, and in five minutes we would attack it live and tell them what the key was. Fortunately, I've I've been out of well out of the country for three four months now, and I don't have the the software licenses anymore. But what I can show you is is how DIY and reproducible this this really is because I was in a different country, just in my university, went into the cupboard and thought I could probably replicate some of this. Uh, so, uh, wrong screen. And the mouse has disappeared. Whoa. Hey. So, um, I'll let this, this play a little bit, then I'll explain exactly what's going on. Um, so, what we have here is uh, a development board with an ARM core, an A9, running the same OpenSSL encryption. And uh, what I'm showing up here is some averaged traces uh, exactly like the one I, I went through and showed you where the key schedule was and the encryption rounds. And down here is just the raw live feed. Um, so each of these spikes is a trigger here that we're using to, to align a few, uh, a few different blocks of encryption. So I'll, I'll let this play. And you can already see there is a bump where the key schedule should be. And then these seven groups of two uh, encryption rounds. So that that is kind of the same signal we were expecting, even though this is a completely different bit of wire here, and it's plugged straight into our our RTL SDR radio, which you can just make out. So this is twenty euros plus a bit of wire. You can see the the signal here is roughly comparable to uh, to the setup we had before. And this was just uh, just from the cupboard. So uh, you can also see as I move the antenna further away again, the signal does die down quite rapidly, which is the problem here. Um, so what we find is is that really really simple uh, small 
small loop antenna we made is actually really good for anything very close by. If you just have to get through a, a sealed plastic case, this could work, and it's, it's essentially free. Um, but because it does die off so quickly, it's not going to be our, our final solution here. So if you move to something uh, slightly more professional, it's still uh, just printed on a PCB. It's, I think this was about 28 euros. Um, this is a, a log periodic antenna, which is a lot more directional. So as we move this further and further away from our target device, we retain more of the signal. So that, that same style of plot here shows that it's now roughly linear as we, as we move the antenna away. Although noting this is in decibels, so you can debate whether that really means it's linear or not. Um, so with our log periodic antenna, it's just the same, same setup really, but now we've got a good 30 centimeters or so between our target device and our antenna. And we're just passing that through some, some amplification and then again into our, our radio. Um, the problem is though, uh, we don't have any, or didn't have any uh, proper filtering for the frequency we're interested in. So to quickly solve that, again, Jasper with his DIY got some uh, emergency blankets uh, lined with aluminium, found a couple of boxes and just wrapped them. So that makes us a nice kind of shielded environment that we can do this test in without having to, to spend lots on uh, filtering. So we've, we've just put that same setup you saw inside this box um, with an A4 sheet of paper roughly for, for scale. So this is about 30 centimeters from the tip of the antenna down to the, the chip here. And our results with that, uh, we managed to perform our attack and get the key from 30 centimeters. And that was with watching almost half a million blocks of encryption, which on our, uh, our setup is only, only 50 seconds. Um, I think the most impressive part of this though, is that is with our really cheap radio dongle, some off the shelf amplifiers and some emergency blankets. So that all came to pretty much $200. Um, which is good for my intern budget. Uh, the kind of final step here though is that is what we got in our, our, our lab environment. But if we had totally ideal conditions, then what would our, our limit be with that? So we're lucky enough uh, to go along to another Dutch company, OSPL, and we got to use their anechoic chamber. Um, so inside this, not only is it shielded, it also absorbs signals so you don't get reflections and things interfering with your, your measurement. So what we've, we've got set up here is our, our target board on a table um, with a, a USB battery pack underneath this aluminium foil. And this alien looking device is our antenna it's a disco antenna, um, which is positioned a meter away from the, the target device. And a really important thing to bring up here is electrical isolation. Um, because if you're going to claim that you've attacked something from this, this distance, you have to kind of be able to defend if, if someone says, well, what if there was something strange happening with your, your ethernet wire was actually you know, conducting some signal. Um, so we were very careful with that here. And uh, we actually totally removed the ethernet communication here. So our, our board was actually sitting in a loop, just encrypting the output of the previous block um, in a loop. So it's completely isolated. It's powered from a battery pack. <laughs> the signal from our antenna comes out of the chamber 
uh, to a laptop. Our amplifiers are powered from a separate battery pack. It's, it's just yeah, physically, physically isolated. Um, so in, in this just very, very uh, clean environment, we managed to do the same attack, getting the key from a full meter away. Uh, this time we needed a little more traces, almost two and a half million. But still, in recording time, that is only five minutes. Uh, with a lot of the, the on-package side channel stuff, it's, it's quite common to have to leave it over the weekend just running your test. But because we're using this radio hardware, we can really just yeah, go get a cup of tea, and that's, that's it. And again, this is with our really, really cheap USB radio, uh, some off-the-shelf amplifiers, but admittedly, we did have the nice disco and antenna here. Um, in fact, I'm going to have time to skip to some uh, some backup slides just to explain that radio thing a bit better. Um, the example setup you almost always see in these papers is uh, you have your your attacker's PC that's connected to your, your targets and an oscilloscope. Uh, the process here is you arm the oscilloscope saying hey, something interesting is going to happen, watch out. You send one single command to your target to make it do some encryption. Um, the oscilloscope's observing something about that target that makes it start recording. So it sits there, it does its recording, saves it to an onboard memory, and then you copy it back through to your your host PC. And that is for a single trace. Um, but this, this arming stage can actually take quite a while. Some of the picoscope ones are 10 milliseconds or so. So if you're doing that for every single trace, this arm trigger copy cycle actually starts to take quite a long time. And that is really just because the amount of data that you're you're generating. Um, so if if you look in the frequency domain here, you've got your your clock that you're interested in. Um, everything up to that point, though, you could just throw away. You're you're not going to use that for your analysis, really. And if you're uh, going to sample that, you have to do it twice as fast as your clock. So. You just generate this this massive amount of data if your clock is significant, but with the radio hardware, what we're actually doing is we take a small band that we can tune. So we we know what our clock frequency is. We tune our radio to be centered on here, and then when the signal is still analog, we can shift everything down to be at a much lower frequency. Uh, really, just through a a multiplication. So now our sampling frequency of that is now related to the bandwidth around the signal we're interested in rather than the absolute frequency itself. So we can sample much, much lower. We just generate less data so we can stream it all and you know do an attack like that in, in five minutes. So just to wrap up then, um, in conclusion, we broke an OpenSSL style AES implementation with a wire and 20 euro dongle. Um, using that radio hardware is something we've only seen in one, one other publication, uh, and it really speeds up the attack. Um, it does start to cause problems if you're trying to attack something that has got countermeasures in it. Some of those can make this a bit difficult. But the real interesting new thing we did here was actually attacking from a distance. Um, and we did that purely by changing the, the analog front end. And we think that is something that really just hasn't been shown before. And you can, uh, you can recover this key from a meter away in five minutes of recording, which is really not bad. So 
thanks for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to field them. Yep. So for that AES implementation, was that done with hardware acceleration, or was that in the pure software implementation? Uh, so the one I, I showed traces for was a pure software one, um, straight from the, the open SSL GitHub. But um, in this project, we did also look at some FPJ implementations. Okay. Um, so we were, we were looking at them when we were still right on top of the chip. Uh, and you can break them, them similarly. You need a, a bigger bandwidth, typically, because if it's hardware accelerated, it takes a shorter time. So in frequency, it, it spreads out. Um, but we decided just to continue with, with the software version, because that would, that would be the easiest for us to attack in the time. Yeah. And then you said you originally used a Cortex-M. Is there a reason you switched from Cortex-M to Cortex-A, or was that just uh, ease of development? So. Um, there is a reason, actually. If I go back to that DIY shielded box, you'll notice um, that was really uh, because we had to. Well, okay, no, right. So <laughs> this this filtering here um, we had for our original board with an M3, um, we could clock that up to 140 megahertz. Um, but these antennas kind of scale in size with uh, the wavelength you're using. So to have any sort of reasonably sized antenna, we needed a board that could go a, a higher clock. Um, so we just switched to what we had available, which was an A9. But it was all because of that antenna size. And then because of that, our filtering changed, so we had to, had to make this space age box. Uh, great, very nice. Um, so you mentioned you had um, a log periodic antenna, yep. but you know precisely the frequency you're working on. So uh, why not use something like Yagi Uda? Would that not help you? Because you have much higher bandwidth uh, gains there and can go further away. Yes. Um, so we did actually have a quick play with, with a, a Yagi antenna for this board at 140. Um, we didn't have much time with it, but we didn't didn't have great results. Uh, I think maybe partially that is because we're still measuring quite a near field effect, and if that antenna is a meter long, then just the effect of that doesn't really quite quite translate. I think, um, but with with like a a smaller Yagi kind of in that form factor. That could give good results. It's not something we've we've had time to test, though. Hi, pretty neat. Um, I was wondering if you guys thought also about uh, modern machine learning techniques for the part of the correlation, because that looks like a typical um, recurrent neural network problem that you could try to tackle with that. And like you take your time, then you transform to frequency, feed it into a neural network, and maybe it could help you also with the decryption. I don't know. That's something um, that looks pretty. Yeah, actually, that that's a good point. That's not something we uh, we considered, but actually, the guy who's now taking over this project, from what I understand, is looking at trying to make this more easily applicable to different targets. So, some machine learning aspect there would be. Ideal, actually, because just now that's that's the part of this that takes a kind of a specialized a analyst to to look at. So if if you think that could be done, then uh, we should have a have a chat. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. We're out of time as well, so okay. I think this is a good time to wrap up. Yeah. Perfect. So we'll